I apologize, I have some notes, but I've got lots to pack in. And actually, there's a couple of questions that people ask, asked, and I didn't want to butt in because I thought, I'm going to be saying it all anyway. But some of the answers to some of the things. But one thing I thought I should mention, um, I'm Zarina, by the way. Um, oh, flipping heck. Right, I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to give up with that. Um, I'm Zarina, by the way. Uh, -da -da. No. Yes! Amazing. That's me. Um, I'm the VP of Product at ScraperWiki. Um, ScraperWiki is a um, company that, as, as our lovely MC just said, um, does things with data on the web. Um, and we help people write code. So we've got developers who write code on our platform and run it and save it, and all the data gets saved with it and stuff like that. Um, but we also do work for clients. Um, so people come to us with their data problems and we solve them out like magic fairies. And Dragon and Dave, who is there, who looks like a he looks like a medieval chap. Um, he, is, he is amazing, and he's, he's very scary when he's wielding a sword or an axe at you, which he does do. Um, I shall leave you to ask, you, ask him about that in the break. Um, but yeah, one of the things that he does is he's amazing at this, and he works with our clients to um, get them the data they want. But when I help him out, one of the things is the indices of deprivation um, in the UK. And that's an example of, although Liverpool might not have that many data sets about it. You can often take national data sets and get a slice. Um, and, oh, you just said that. <laughs> Dragon's already beat me to it. I told you how legendary this chap is. Um, but yeah, that's, that's one option if you can't get the data yourself. Um, anyway, my talk was, as you may have noticed, to see they can open data. Um, because I just exactly a year ago finished a master's um, on the, uh, in Oxford. Um, at the Oxford Internet Institute, um, studying social science um, of the internet. And I specialised in open data, um, because I sort of saw that this, it had already about two years ago become a buzzword, and I thought it would be interesting to investigate more about it. Um, and you'll be seeing some of the results of my master's thesis um, and the research that I did for it in a second. Um, but I thought I'd give you a quick overview of what sort of open data means to me. Um, I'm going to be looking at um, what open data actually is, um, who's using it, who's making it, and who's publishing it, um, and whether there's a business model um, attached to open data, um, because I think that's probably why we're all here. Um, and the good answer is yes, there is. So there is a happy ending, so stick with me, okay? Um, deep breath. Uh, what's open data? So um, there's loads of definitions of what open data is. Um, some are long and some are short. There's a long one um, published by our friends at the Open Knowledge Foundation. Um, it looks like that, or at least that's the first quarter of it. Um, but yeah, they summarise it to um, about a sentence, which is something like um, it's data that's made available for anybody to use without limit um, for free blah, blah, blah. Um, but generally, most definitions of open data I find sort of lacking, um, and especially in our work um, at Spraperwick, you generally come across three types of open data. Um, there's generally open data, which is usually from governments. It's usually forced down the local authorities or the department's throat um, by somebody higher up who wants them to release it. Um, and then... Yeah, that's, that's, that's what people, that's, that's the roots of open data really. It's, it started off as a government thing. Um, and as Geordie said, it's spreading all over the place and governments in different countries are picking it up. Um, and there's also um, data from NGOs that falls into that category like the World Bank or the OECD, things like that. And there's cool data sets there. Um, there's also, and they get a mere face from it because we're not really interested in that. Um, the smiley face goes to data as a service which is another buzzword, I'm afraid, sorry. Um, but it's sort of interesting, this idea of um, supplying data as a subscription. So just like you can have a platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, and software as a service. Um, so some of you might know software as a service like salesforce.com or basically every startup since 2009 has basically been software as a service. Um, data as a service is a new category with a couple of players in it that are supplying data feeds to people um, you pay either for the access to it or a subscription to the data or something like that. Um, or ones that you don't necessarily pay for. So APIs, there's loads of social data out there. 
um, Twitter, LinkedIn, Foursquare, blah, 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 the list goes on. Um, I'd probably class that as open data, um, but it sort of stretches, it stretches the, um, the, the usual definition a little bit. Um, and then there's not so open data, which is what Scraper Wiki does quite well. Um, so we take those PDFs that um, Alistair was just talking about um, and get the data out of them, web pages, things that people aren't specifically stopping you getting that data, but they haven't got around to making it open yet. And there is shed loads of that um, out on the web. Um, and there's loads of tools for dealing with it. Spreadbook is one of them. Plug over. Um, yeah. Uh, the general background, although Geordie covered it quite well, is that it sort of has um, roots even before the government it has roots in open source. Um, so this idea, generally open source and open data are quite similar ideas behind them. There's communities of people participating, um, there's flows of information, data generally over the internet. Um, stickers will probably say there was open source before the internet, but I'd argue it didn't really take off. Um, and then there's the agreement of common protocols to share this data around. So when you're getting data these days from APIs, chances are it's going to be as JSON because everybody seems to have agreed that's the best way of transporting it around. Um, or if you're requesting it, it's probably going to be HTTP, which was agreed years and years and years ago. Blah blah. blah. So there's loads of um, there's loads of backstory as to what I probably class as open data, but I probably bored you enough. Um, yeah, um, I as part of my um, thesis. Uh, studied the open data community um, and I did one of the things I did, I interviewed some key players um, in the open data field in the UK and the US but I also um, did content analysis of 175 open data, what self-identifying open data web apps. So applications on the web, I chose the web because it was easier to get to them um, than the iTunes app store or whatever. Um, and try to find out what data they were dealing with, where they got the data from, who made them. And it turned out that out of these 175 um, web applications that were using open data, depending how you sliced it, about 50% to 75% were developed by a lone individual. Um, and that surprised me because I'd done lots of research into the history of open data as part of the open source movement. I'd heard about this open data community and everybody was banding together to share their data and pass it around. Um, and it sort of, from what I could tell, it turned out that it was loads of single guys in their bedrooms hacking on this stuff, from what I could tell. Um, now, it might be, might be true or it might not. I hope it's not. And, at the other end of that, there was a long tail and there was a very fat head of some, a few projects that are really, really community focused. Um, and those are the ones that are succeeding. The other sad truth about this, and you'll see a network graph to prove it in a bit, is that um, a lot of these applications that were developed by one guy just ended up lost or forgotten. Um, from what I could tell, none of them were in version control, the source wasn't published anywhere, the data wasn't published anywhere, it was just like a dead end. A lot of them made from hack days, um, which are normally raises the other great thing about open data, but um, if you don't do anything with the stuff you make on a hack day, it's not worth much. So the hack days at Scrape Cookie runs who try and solve that risk. It's, it's difficult to do. Um, uh, yeah, so um, talking about the, um, the community that I found in my research, um, who's using the data um, a bit like open source. Um, when I interviewed people and in the literature review, it turned out that there was generally two things that made people deal with open data, and this, bear in mind, was a year and a half ago. Um, generally, they either did it because they liked the ideology, the idea of um, making government more accountable, or the idea of getting more value out of their tax dollars, or whatever. Um, or they liked, they needed the data, and they were scratching an itch, um, or they had a problem they needed to solve and the data solved it. Um, and who's using it now? This will be interesting. Um, I've got to do this backwards. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? There. PCs. I really don't like PCs. <laughs> Oh my god, brilliant. Um, I, I won't spend too long on this. You can 
You can email me. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> you can email me for it if you want a copy of the PDF or the thesis in general. It's only 500 words. It's really accessible. Um, it's 500 words. 50 pages. Five, five, seven, nine, ten thousand. Ten thousand words. God. I can't. I can't even remember. Like it's all a blur. Um, generally, uh, when I graph the open data, you end up with. Um, a gigantic sludge down there. Um, as George said, there's loads of competitions with open data. Um, and one of them that was running just the year before, uh, no, a month or two before this, was the World Bank had an um, apps for development competition. Um, and they, oh, hey, we've got some cheers at the back. We'll find out about it in the next Oh, will I? You'll find out more about that in the upcoming talk. Um, by one of our headliners, not one of, I'm, I'm way down the list. Um, but yeah, there was this gigantic, oh wow, I can point. There's this gigantic like <laughs> splodge of applications that were developed by one guy using just the World Bank data. Um, and there was sort of stuff down here by the OK, OKFN and they all sort of worked together and they used some of this development data from the World Bank. Um, the World Bank, in my sample, was by far the biggest supplier of open data. Now it was probably because um, they just did that competition and everybody used it and those were all the apps I could find. Um, interestingly as well, there was a couple of clusters um, further up. So we had a couple of clusters around government data and a couple of plus, a cluster around mapping um, and loads and loads of applications that were sort of just sitting there connected to one data source. I was surprised how few people combined data sources um, most amazing magic can happen when you combine different data sources. Um, and it's a shame that a lot of people just end up making one view on one data set. It's like, missed opportunity. Um, so make sure you do that as well. Uh, but anyway, that's, yeah, I've probably spent more than long enough on that for now. Um, I will go back to Sassine Path Open Data. Uh, Smooth, right? Um, so yeah, as well as as well as that, we, as we saw, the um, World Bank was an example of somebody supplying data. Um, there's loads of data from all over the place. Geordie covered this, which is amazing because he's saving me a job, so I won't have to show the network diagram again. Um, who's making it? Governments and NGOs and um, corporations, actually. Um, somebody asked, "Are corporations doing this?" And they're starting to. Um, a friend of Scrape Wiki called Chris Taggart, who's a bit of a name in the UK data scene, um, is he set up a website called Openly Local, and he's also set up a website called Open Corporates, um, and that is trying to, you know, like Companies House, you can go on and find out about a company. Open Corporates is trying to make that data available for free as open data. They've got an amazing API, and it's all up to date. Um, I should, I, should make, I should make clear that they do use Scrape Wiki to scrape most of that data, but um, that's a good thing, um, because then it's up to date and it's whatever. Uh, but yeah, the corporations as well from the inside are doing it. Um, so about two years ago, Facebook open sourced their um, data center CAD plans and specifications, because they realized that they're not leading the world in data center building, so they may as well release that data for everybody else. Uh, because running a data center, cooling it, um, are big problems when, you, when you're a company the size of Facebook or Google. Um, so they released that as open data, um, and funny enough, a guy, a couple of, I think it was a couple of weeks after they released it, got in touch with them, said, I've worked out how you could save X billion dollars a year, um, and I'll tell you if you pay me a couple of million, and they did it, and now they save X billion dollars a year because they open sourced that, and none of their staff had realized it before. Um, that's a good thing about open data. Um, and as well, um, Nike realized um, around the same time that the world has reached peak cotton. Um, we can make no more cotton than we are making at the moment, ladies and gentlemen. Hold on to your shirts. Um, so Nike decided to release as much information as they could um, about their um, production line. So where they get their cotton from, how much cotton their producers have made, um, all that sort of information. And they tried to make it open. Um, I think it's called abetterworld.org or something like that. Um, it sort of stalled recently, which is a shame because it was a great example to tag out at dinner parties and speeches like this. 
Um, but that's there is definitely a feel, especially among some of the bigger corporations, the more techie corporations, that they should be releasing this data, especially when it's not something, it's not corporate secrets, it's not something that gives them a competitive edge, um, and it's something that could benefit from being made public. So there's data from corporations, and as I said earlier, there's data from APIs and data as a service, so things like data sift, which allow you to um, get hold of the Twitter firehose, um, all sorts of applications, come start me later, and loads of people here probably know more about those applications than me. Um, so what's the problem? Why am I so depressed? Why is accessing NAPAT open data? Um, generally, there are four problems facing open data. One, especially from governments, but as we saw from um, corporations as well, is the reluctance to share data. Um, because they think that they've spent all this money and time collecting this data, I don't want to share it or they think that their corporate trade secrets are going to go out. Um, sometimes it's for good reason. Um, um, public um, information, private information shouldn't really be, needs to be anonymized, blah, blah, blah. So sometimes it takes time to do that. Um, there's different degrees of openness, as I said. So there's like this, there's open data and there's sort of not so open data, and there's open data but not documented. So you've got no idea what you're going to get. And you've got APIs that are generally broken, and whatever, there's, it's not as clear cut as this data set is now open, three stars on it. Um, Tim Berners-Lee came up with like a five star rating for open data, which sort of helps in this regard, but it's still a bit of a minefield. Um, there's the issue of reliability of data. Um, yeah, one big problem is provenance, um, which oh, I feel like I'm ranting, it's like terrible. Uh, one big problem is provenance. Uh, do you know where the data has come from? Can you see the history of it? When did it change? Um, depending on what you're doing, this can be, can be a bit tricky. Um, and we're still, as an industry in general, trying to work out the best way to solve that. Um, it's something that has been solved with source code by Git and version control systems before that. To an extent, you could see who's every single line of code, you could see who had edited it. Or we haven't quite got the same for data yet. Um, and uh, big data equals big requirements. Thought I'd get another um, buzzword in there, buzzword compliant. Um, big data, big requirements, you often need to get a data scientist in. Generally, we term big data. Spray cookie doesn't really, really deal in big data normally. Big data is normally data you can't fit into Excel or data you can't run on one computer. Um, and a lot of data sets, even when you go onto data.gov, you download them and you try and open them in Excel, and Excel just crashes, and you realize, oh, I can't actually do anything with this data. Um, I remember doing something with, something with Mozilla data about their Firefox user experience data, and it was like a four gigabyte um, Excel file, and it's like, well, good luck. Um, so that's, that, that can be tricky as well. Um, but the good news is, is there a business? Yes. Um, the the fact that you need to decide on these protocols, the fact that we don't have provenance means that someone is going to get stinking rich when they figure out how to do this. Um, the fact that, I can't remember what the other ones were, the, uh, oh yeah, the, the reluctance to share. Um, people like Capita are making a shed load out of opening up the government's data. Um, I would love to see more people like the people in this room make that data. Um, make that money, but yeah, there's, there's definitely a, an opening there. If you can educate companies and departments on how to open their data up, um, generally they know they should be doing it and they're really thankful for the help. Um, so part of it is also making it easy for people to share this data. Um, that's one of the things that the OKFM does quite well. Um, they try and build data hubs that these governments can just put their data in and not worry about it. Um, but yeah. Things like that. I think I think that that's a good sign. Um, the fact that you need um, data scientists to handle proper big data um, is good if you want to become a data scientist. But it's also good if you want to become a consultant um, who sells off and sets up their own uh, data as a service service. Um, so you can provide data that your customers need um, without them having to get their hands dirty. Um, and yeah, that's probably about it. Um, I think that was the end, yeah, associated with their open data. Um, I hope I haven't been too depressing, um, but yeah, I think it's, it's definitely getting there, um, but it seems to have stalled a little bit. It's got a little bit slow. 
And I think, I think there needs to be more oomph in the open data scene. Um, it's possibly because somebody needs to solve those four problems at the end. Um, and we're at Scrapework, you're really, really keen on solving those problems. So if you've got any ideas about how to solve those problems, um, catch me at the bar um, or get in touch. Um, but yeah, good luck. Better in that case, then we're going to take a tissue. I think there was one there. Uh, yeah, I think mean, maybe I'll get another question oh. to start because maybe a yeah. dashboard crowd or something. Uh, <laughs> there, there's another source of open data, which is all the text online. Mm. Uh, so there's another whole way of doing text analytics. Of yeah. There's a huge industry around that. <coughs> but another source that's tied more closely to the government uh, is, for instance, the National Archives has made available all of UK legislation, the laws, also highly structured these, this kind of information. So it's not always a matter just of, you know, what's the temperature at every point in the UK. There's also this content which yeah. kind of thing. Do you have any relation to that kind of um, thing? We've, I don't think we've spoke the legislation stuff. Um, we do some text um, processing um, of various courses. Um, all sorts. There's loads of projects that I can't actually tell you about, which is really annoying. But um, yeah, I think generally this whole country, well, every country, runs on data. Um, so there are these amazing data sets that are usually locked away in filing cabinets or are stuck on old PCs somewhere. Um, and it's quite exciting when, you, when like, um, I remember the um, National Library making a lot of that data available. Um, and it's quite amazing because you can find really cool stuff in there. Um, some of the, uh, Matthew Somerville, who works with my society, is sort of behind one of the Open Shakespeare projects, I think, as well, that have been trying to make all his works for Shakespeare available um, in an easily accessible format um, for everybody to use and comment on and mark up and edit. Um, there's all sorts of unusual data sets out there that you wouldn't normally think of. Like numbers and statistics are great because you can make visualizations out of them and find stuff, but um, that you can get visualization overload. Um, so yeah, finding and doing uh, natural language processing, there's, there's really good packages out there these days for programming languages like Python and stuff like that to, to find uh, the general mood of, even if it's from something as simple as like sentiment analysis on Twitter, um, which has become mainstream now, which five years ago would have been unheard of, um, to to yet yeah, like analysing God knows what out of the all arts and cultural data in the UK since the year 1000. Um, it's yeah, it's exciting. The the thing is finding um, a problem that it solves.